All right. I appreciate being on today to talk about all in the family preparing clients for the transition plan experience. I see a lot of familiar faces online, so welcome. And a little dark in my location here today, a little gloomy here in the state of Ohio, so I feel like I'm a little dark in the background. But if you need a copy of these slides afterwards, we'll be able to get those to you and any of the resources that I might talk about. I want to make sure that you have those as well. So if you have questions during it, just drop them into the chat, and I'm sure Heather will be watching the chat um, behind the scenes for me, and any of the materials that I talked about that if you want uh, in the future, just, just drop me an email, and my title slide will be at the end of the presentation so that you have that. I've been working in farm um, succession planning since back in, what really catalyst was a catalyst for us in Ohio was a 2006 grant that we received from the North Central Risk Management Agency, and that kind of really got our farm succession workshops off and running across the state of Ohio. And today I'm talking about kind of how we methodically will go through and with farm succession, our transition, I'm going to use that word interchangeably, how we do that with farm families here. And some of the stuff is not new to many of you who are here because some of the stuff, of course, through extension, we have borrowed and shared and we have gleaned from each other um, through the certified um, training here with IFTN. Of course, a lot of this was shared, but this is just kind of our approach here in the Eastern Corn Belt here in Ohio. My objective is to, to share insight on preparing farm families for the transition planning experience. Again, how we would walk through it in the state of Ohio, and then also share a new spreadsheet. At the end, I want to talk about a spreadsheet that we are in the beta testing version right now to kind of show you how we're going to help farm families pull some of the stuff together to be more successful with their attorney as they're pulling their estate together. So we'll share that and, and would welcome feedback on that if you want to take a look at that later. So I always start with this. We start this at the workshops, and I think we all know this here. Every family, especially those who work in a family business, are in some ways dysfunctional. And I think if it's one of the goals that we do in working with farm families is to understand that this functionality is okay and that we can work through dysfunctionality because every family has dysfunctionality. So we get that off um, right at the start with the families. And our approach is like many others where we look at it, this is a three-legged stool uh, with transition planning. Again, the word succession planning, uh, we use them interchangeably. You'll hear me share both of those words today, but the transition planning and the estate planning in our workshops. And we spend a lot of time in that middle leg on family dynamics. And that usually is touching down on how do we improve family communication among family members. So if you're interested in seeing how we do this, we do regional workshops across the state. These are either day long workshops or they're two day workshops. But we also three years ago, um, because of COVID, we moved to an online platform where we host a four evening session so they're on in the evenings for a couple hours each uh, during the winter and you can see this year in, in 2024 as we move into next year february 5th 12th 19th and 26th we hold our workshops in the evening and for one price the families can jump on and regardless of where their kids are or their grandkids we allow the entire family to join for one registration price if you're interested in seeing how we are how we're doing that online platform, don't hesitate to let me know and I'll give you a courtesy registration link so that you can get in and watch what we do. We also have materials uh, put together specific for the state of Ohio. Uh, one of them is our planning for the future, your family farm planning and dis discussion guide. That's about a 40 page guide that we put together for worksheets. So if families have some specific issues that they wanna work through together as a family, there is a worksheet that they can use and then later I'm gonna talk about getting your family and farm affairs in order. And this is a PDF that we've been using for years and we are transitioning that now into an Excel version uh, to work for the farm families. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the first thing that uh, we like to help families look at is the legacy of the farm and helping families appreciate the legacy that they have. Now there's a couple different as we attach a problem, and this is a problem, right? The problem is, is how do we get this next, this farm to the next generation successfully? So looking at a couple of different problem solving approaches or how we help farm families plan for the future, we kind of looked at two models. And of course, the, the one on the left, many of you will see the problem solving. And this is what farmers are really good at, right? 
uh, there is a felt need. There's a problem that exists. There could be some some type of new disease on the corn. And that, so that creates the felt need. I, I need to solve this problem. And then we look at the causes. What are some potential causes that could be here in Ohio? If it's a new disease on corn, it's probably tar spot. But they start to look at the different um, causes that could um, could have made that problem occur. And then they'll start to look at possible solutions. And then they'll jump into action. And then it's basically the treatment phase. So the traditional problem-solving approach, organizing is a problem to be solved. The other approach is probably something that may not be as familiar to all of us on the call, and, and it was not familiar to me at all, but it's a community development type of process, and it's been around since the early 80s, used an extension. It's used by our, our community development um, professionals across the country, but this is how do you help a community envision the way that they want their community to be in a future? And they use a process called, or can use a process called appreciative inquiry. So as you pull your community together, you start to take a look at the appreciation of what is, what is really good about the community. What do we have that makes us special um, comparatively to other regions? And then the community will have, um, start to envision what might be, what could our future look like? And as they brainstorm that, they'll start to dialogue about where do we want to go? So you brainstorm through that envisioning process, then you start to dialogue about it. And then after you've dialogued and gone through that, some pretty serious discussions, then you innovate. Basically, that's your treatment phase, just like the problem solving approach, where you jump in and then your community rolls forward. So it's an organizing is a mystery to be embraced. In the community I was in, we did an appreciative inquiry. I can tell you early in my career, I wanted to get to problem solving, get right to it. An appreciative inquiry takes some time to filter through, to envision, to dialogue, to appreciate what's there, and then to move forward. So for our community, when we did it, one of the things the community strongly said was they wanted to protect farmland. They wanted to protect farms in the county that I was in. And that led actually to a huge problem solving approach, which was into a farm, a complete farmland preservation plan for the community. So how can we take these two approaches, one which farmers are very, very um, familiar with, problem solving approach, and then how can you blend the appreciative inquiry into that? Because we know our farms, it's just, when we're thinking about farm succession, it's just not an easy, see a problem, look at the alternatives and then solve the problem. Because we have so much of our family, we have so much of our family legacy that is part of that farm. How can we incorporate both of them together? So basically what you can see is this is the outcome of these two processes kind of coming together. So as we look at farm transition here, the steps that we will help farm uh, families go through is it's kind of modified and appreciative inquiry approach where we look at a discovery phase, then we dream, then we dialogue, then we design, and then we implement. So if we look at each of those phases, and today, uh, quite quickly, uh, this is a six-hour course uh, that we do with farm families. I'm going to try to step you through each of these uh, planning phases. So the discovery phase, that's where we look at the appreciation side and we identify the errors. We take a look at the business as it stands today. And then as a family, we dream or we brainstorm. So we're looking at goal setting. We're looking at gaining some input from heirs about their, their vision for the future of the farm. And then we go in the dialogue phase. And I think this is this is the one, right? We know this is the tough one because we have a lot of past hurts and habits and hangups that our family might have when it comes with regards to our family communication. So taking time to talk about family communication, identifying the communication barriers that exist within the families, and then what are some things that we can do in the context of that dialogue that we can be, we can be more successful in our communication. For example, using family business meetings. And then you get into that whole design aspect of the farm succession or the transition process. That's how do we get the next manager up and ready to go for that transition for them to leave the farm in the future. At the same time, anticipating all the things that could go wrong. We talk a lot in farm succession, right, about the D's, the discord, divorce, 
um, the dysfunctionality that we might have in the family. And then we look at those dysfunctionality things like the elephants in the rooms. And then we make sure as we're designing our farm succession plan that we're keeping our eye um, right on the estate planning side of that, where we're using the different things in the estate planning that our attorneys will help us with uh, to make sure that our transition plan melts really nicely into the estate plan that we have for our assets as they move to the next generation. And then ultimately, that's the destiny phase, putting the timeline together, looking at that five to seven year process where we can put this succession timeline in order so that we can uh, go at a measured pace to get the transition going. And then, of course, we're doing some constant evaluation. So we like to see success as a process to be embraced here in Ohio. So what I would like to do is go through just quickly uh, these different phases. So the discovery phase, of course, uh, having our families pause to appreciate and understand the legacy uh, of their farm. Um, some some farm families just want to get to the to, to the heart of the issue, but if they're especially if they're having some communication issues, it's really nice even in our family business meetings to pause and to have some type of exercise at the beginning where we look back at the legacy of the farm, because not only are we appreciating where we were, but it's helping us kind of quietly know what our values are and the things that we're going to stand for for the future. So the, the legacy and some of the questions that we would ask during this process, and, and these are, again, worksheets, and you can design the program in any way that you want, but what is the, this could be as simple as sitting at the farm table, right? What is the history of the family and farm? Tell me about it. What are some points um, of pride? And that could be the historical points of pride. Uh, what are some current points of pride? What's the farm's mission statement? What are the goals um, for the future of the farm? And for the senior generation, what is the legacy? What is the legacy that they want to leave for the farm business in the future? If they had to look back 30 years from now and to see or look forward 30 years, if they pass away today, what would that farm look like in 30 years? And what is their desire for that to be? So just helping the family take some time before jumping in and um, into the nitty gritty of this farm transition plan, taking some time to, to really, really look at the legacy of the farm. And of course, part of this process of who are your heirs. So these are both personal and business heirs. So again, identifying those heirs, whether they're families and friends, whether the churches and charities, civic organizations, community groups. So who, who really will be the heirs of these assets that we were entrusted with? And what involvement do the heirs desire for the future of the business? Uh, we have, we'll see a lot of farms that they haven't even asked the children and the grandchildren um, what their desire for the future involvement in the business would be. And sometimes the, the parents, the senior generation are shocked that the son or daughter who really would like to be part of the farm but has never been asked. And what will they do once, once you're gone? How will, they, how will they operate that farm in the future? And this is where I come down personally um, with, with my thought about who should be the heirs of the different things that we've been entrusted with. Who is going to be the best, who or whom is going to be the best caretaker of what you've been entrusted with? So that could be something as a, a big as the, the entire farm, the acres that we have. It could be down to the family butter churn. And who is going to be the best caretaker of what you have been entrusted with? And sometimes that will open the eyes of some of our clients, some of our fam farm families to say, well, maybe there are more heirs that we have than just our immediate bloodline. Because now we're starting to see more people who come to us and say, I do not have an immediate bloodline. I have no son or daughter. Or my son and daughters have already predeceased me. So who do I leave this to? I don't have any heirs. Well, they do have heirs. The errors are who are the person or per people that will be the best caretaker of this property or the farm or the assets that we have. And then the methodical moving through analyzing the business. Um, this is where um, in the farm financial world, we love to, to jump in to help them about what's the current and financial position of the farm and what's the viability of, for the farm in the future. Looking at does this business generate income enough income for multiple generations if that next generation wants to come back now, 
And if there is enough, how do we do that? If there is not enough, how can we increase capacity so that they can? What's the um, income potential? Are there some things, some opportunities that we haven't been able to do on the farm because maybe a lack of labor, or maybe we need to pivot and raise a different commodity or a different type of livestock. And then having them go through a SWOT analysis with the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I'm still surprised on the number of farm and families that have not been through a SWOT analysis as they look at their operation and what's our organization structure look like. If we are having multiple parties involved, how can everyone get involved? And then looking at the question of, okay, I have non-business heirs as well. How are they gonna be involved in the future? So part of this is developing a good balance sheet. And this is just not the balance sheet that they may take to their lender to get their operating loan, but the true value uh, of, of their business. Uh, putting together a balance sheet is part of our exercise that we like to accomplish. Again, just using something as a, a piece of paper going through the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of each of the sectors of our business. So it could be our employee management. Let's look at a SWOT analysis at our employee management. Let's take a SWOT analysis of the farm resources that we have. Um, so you could go through each sector of our business and do a SWOT analysis on that. And what's our organization structure look like? Uh, I think just having them go through the process of just actually drawing um, what the organization structure of the farm looks like today, and then what's it gonna look like in the future? Because say for instance, an LLC, we may be a sole proprietor um, and maybe a partnership, maybe between two brothers or just sole proprietor where actually dad's a sole proprietor, but mom's um, part of that picture as well. Well, then as we go through our state of plan, a state plan, then maybe we throw in a business structure like an LLC. So not only do we need to communicate what the current structure looks like, but to the succeeding generation, to have the whole family know that if we're going to transition through the estate plan to a business structure like an LLC, what will that organizational structure look like after mom and dad are gone? So just having them go through and actually put a picture down of what that structure looks like um, can be very eye-opening for them. And then we go through multiple sheets. So this is multiple sheets. Uh, so this is why this, this process can take a while. Looking at the goals looking at mission statements, looking at this organization and structure, looking at each operating entity with multiple operating entities that farms have uh, with these LLCs that have been created. Uh, maybe it's the corporations, maybe it's the partnerships they have, but making sure we understand what, what operating entities are actually in play in the farm. And then have each member complete individual assessments so strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats on each individual family member that's part of the business, because part of this transition process is having that plan to increase the capacity of that next generation to lead. So what things do we need to school them up for or in so that they're ready to manage this farm um, at the best level once we're gone? And then completing that um, balance sheet, looking at financial statements for the past five years and tax returns, getting uh, really deep into those numbers, and then updating our machinery tools and building inventory. Again, these are very important parts of the farm succession process, but also they, they, they dovetail right into our estate plan and putting everything in order for our estate plan. And then re reviewing our insurance coverages, our risk management, risk management portfolio. Um, there's a whole section in, in here of how do we get the next generation to know what the government programs are through the Farm Service Agency, um, if there's any NRCS programs they're involved in, crop insurance programs, what are the other insurance programs, whether that's personal property insurance, what do they need to be aware of for the future, and then you have the whole re human resource employee management portion of the business, and then looking about, well, what do our retirement and transition investment and estate plans, what do those look like? And then also having finally, and probably I should put this first, having a handle on what are the actual living expenses for each partner or future partner in the business. So then we, we jump into the dream 
phase. So we know in brainstorming that there are no bad ideas in brainstorming. So especially as facilitators, as farm succession coordinators, and when we're going out, is how can we help families to have good brainstorming sessions about what that farm could look like in the future without family members shutting each other down? So how do we keep an open environment for them to go through this brainstorming process? Which part of this should be identifying the goals for the future. So that's goals for all members. So that could be the senior generation, intermediate generation, the junior generation. They can um, pull goals aside for the on-farm heirs versus the off-farm heirs. Um, but what are the goals for the future? Um, we like to ask, ask questions. And some, some people, they need time to reflect. So with time for reflection, sometimes it's nice to have a, a handy worksheet that you can hand them. Um, the parents can hand their kids or their grandkids and, and ask those questions. And you can see the first question that we ask on this question for my heirs worksheet is what do you appreciate about the family business? So this is before we're jumping into some of the other questions, but helping them just pause and reflect on the legacy of the farm, but also the greater appreciation that they have for the family business, um, because that will tie into what they may want to do in the future. And asking them their thoughts on who should own and operate the business in the future. Um, how would you like to be involved with the future? Um, so they can answer those. Um, these could be just conversations that we can have around the, the dining room table if we're a family that's really open in our communi com communication patterns. Sometimes it has to be a worksheet where you give um, each person and they have time to reflect on it. And then they're able to turn it back into the farm succession coordinator or back to the person or persons that are kind of driving the farm succession discussion. And then you get in the dialogue phase. And, in, and on IFTN, we've had workshops on effective communication and barriers to communications and all the different um, things that can make communication go haywire. So important as we work with families, what are some of the barriers to your communication in your family, in your family business? Uh, whether that is uh, the generational differences in communication, uh, whether that's differences between genders and how they communicate or what is the difference between the siblings as far as personality to go through, identify the communication issues and identify some of the things that might be adding stress into the family that will stress the communication patterns that we have. So specifically, this could be a whole program in itself, just this one slide here. Um, and with some families, they, they really need a lot of help working through the communication barriers that they have. Then you get to get jump into the design phase and that's creating a plan uh, to develop the next generation of managers. I kind of joke in our workshops, like write down everything that you do on the farm in a year's, year's time. Could you do it? And most, most farmers will roll their eyes and they'll say, there's no way I can write down everything that I know and everything that I have to do on the farm. But here's really the goal about developing that next manager, right? It's about making sure everything that we know how to run this operation has been transferred in some manner to the next generation so that in turn, they will be more successful when they are operating the farm. So talking about the managerial transition plan, uh, of course we've determined, we have to determine, we've talked about who are our heirs, uh, but some farms in where I'm at in Ohio, we have two different types of farm, farm heirs. On one side, we may have the farm heir that is truly going to be the farming heir. And they are going to take over the operation. They're gonna continue the farm as a production farm and they are gonna run that farm. And then where I'm located on the Eastern side of the state with a lot of part-time and a lot of small farms here on the Appalachia side of, of Ohio, we have a lot of farmers who when they pass away, their son or daughter may not be the production person that operates the farm. Instead, they become, they step into the role of being a landlord. So depending on the type of error that you have, heir or heirs that you have, 
you may be methodically going through teaching them how to do the production side of the operation, or you may be on this complete side, which is I'm really what I'm developing is the best landlord that they truly can be. Do they know how to read a soil test? Do they know how to craft a land lease? Do they have a relationship with their extension folks in the county so that they know what the average rental rate for their for their land is in the county? Do they have a relationship then? How do they build relationships with tenant farmers that will be farming the ground that they have? And then have they negotiated through the different risk management things that they need to do when it comes to insurance and taxes and the other things they need to maintain the farm buildings? So which do you have? And some farm families are going to have people that represent both sides of that. So putting a plan, how do you develop both? And then, of course, we always encourage using job descriptions and family business meetings. So first, helping them know, number one, how to write a job description. So being able to give them some sample job descriptions that they can write. And then also, what's the best way to run those family business meetings? And then start to develop those timeline and benchmarks for the transition of different management areas. So what is the timeline for the farm finances to be turned over from the senior generation to the next generation? When is the timeline for deciding who gets to um, find the inputs that we're using on the farm or marketing the crops, uh, securing those contracts, maybe a corn or soybean or a wheat contract? When and how will that be transitioned? And I, li I like pictures. I like to put um, place things in, in people's mind to think about. And, and one of those things I we say about approach to this next generation, you know, I was in a situation where we had to learn everything and get everything in order in the span of seven weeks when my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So we had seven weeks to get everything in order and for this whole managerial transition to, to occur in seven weeks. Some people don't have that luxury. Uh, it may be a sudden heart attack. Um, that takes one of our our major operators out of our farm. So how do we how do we make sure that we have everything taught to the next generation that needs to be taught? So the two approaches that we we like to visualize is the three sixty five day approach, the one on the left, the calendar approach, and that is to challenge that senior generation to transition or teach one thing at one thing a day. So at the end of the year, three hundred and sixty five days in the year. At the end of the year, the next generation should have 365 new tools in their, in their toolbox, knowing how to operate that farm. And on the flip side, what we challenge that younger generation to do is, okay, are you methodically asking or trying to discover one thing a day that will increase your abilities to run this farm in the future? So if you do the math that you take the 365 times two, um, and, and most of the times when you ask you, if you had to write everything down that you do on the farm, how many lines would you have on a sheet of paper? And when you start to think, well, that's thousands and thousands and thousands of things I do. Well, you think if you can chip off 750 to 800 of those things that you need to teach each year, and you push that over a seven to a 10 year period, I think you can probably get most of the things that you need to teach to the next generation if you're very methodical about your approach. For some people, it means the discipline of hanging a calendar in the farm office or in the barn or in the door or right next to the door where they walk out where they physically have to write down what they taught that day. That's some people will need that discipline to be able to go back to a calendar to write that down. And maybe today I don't see my son or daughter. We don't train anything, but that means when I we're together on Saturday, that maybe I need to teach six or seven different things on that day that we're working um, on the weekend. And then, of course, the other one um, is the opossum approach. And this is the great one just to leave your cell phone on the table, leave, leave for two weeks if I'm the senior generation during the busiest time of the year and see how the next generation does. And of course, uh, most some farmers will shake their head and say there's no way the whole place would be burned down or the cows would be sold or something disastrous would happen if that is the case. If we were to leave our cell phone, leave for two weeks and not be in any communication with the next generation. 
So on the flip side, side, I would challenge them to say, well, then that means that your farm is not ready to operate without you. So what way can we make sure the next generation is ready? And we ask the questions of the next generation. Again, I, I put the questions up here on the screen, but these are questions that are in a worksheet to have the next generation think about. If you had to take over the business today, what would you be the most concerned about? So if I'm mom and dad and I've asked this question to my son or daughter, what would you be the most concerned about? And they list five things. Guarantee if I'm serious about the transition of the business, I'm going to attack those five things on my son or daughter's list today because that's what they're most concerned about. And I wanna make sure if something happens today and I'm gone, that those things are taken off their list. What changes need to be made for you to have a continuing interest in the business? So are there some things that we do that maybe we shouldn't do in the future? I grew up on a dairy farm and I will say there are a lot of my counterparts in school we're saying if I want to have a, if they wanted to have a continuing interest in the business, then that meant that they did not have an interest in those dairy cows that were on the farm, but they might have had an interest in some other enterprise that they could raise. What are the weaknesses that need to be addressed? The training opportunities. So having the next generation really, really think about what are some weaknesses that need to be addressed. Met with a farm family last week young man is really gifted in running the production side of the business. And the same question I asked him, what is the one thing that you're most concerned about if mom and dad aren't here in a month? What is a weakness that we need to help you with? And his, first, his, his one and only response was, I don't have a clue about the financial side of this business. I know how to do everything. I just don't have any idea on how the finances are worked on this farm. And this is not a small farm. This is quite sizable farm here in the state of Ohio. So right away, mom and dad's ears perked up and said, we need to address this so that we can get him ready to take over the, to take over the farm. And then to have that thoughtful discussion about what's the expectation for an appropriate time for management control to be transferred. Now, sometimes our expectations don't translate into the way that it will actually work out in the transition process, but at least there's the dialogue that occurs between the generations to talk about how can we be um, thoughtful about the management control? When should certain pieces be transferred to the next generation to be under their control? And then designing the plan to antici anticipate the unexpected and we all have these lists, right? What's the, what's on your list? How are, how are you prepared for death or disagreements, discord? Again, another family I met with the um, last week, uh, the brothers farming together, really nice farm operation, but the only way the brothers communicate is through their mother. So what happens when mom is gone, dad is gone out of the picture? How do we have those discussions to between two brothers who won't speak to each other because their wives don't like each other. So how do we help them? How do we help them today? And that's mom and dad's goal for our interactions is how do we get the boys to have a better relationship to, so they can have those conversations. We know divorces and second marriages come into play in a lot of families. So how do we prepare and mitigate for that? Now, for some families, that means a prenuptial agreement has to be signed or a postnuptial agreement. Uh, for others, it would be business structure that allows for the business continuity to happen um, when there's some issues that might happen within the marriages. Uh, disability, if someone gets hurt, someone goes in, into the nursing, um, nursing home, long-term care. Robert Moore taught one of our IFTN sessions a few months ago about long-term care and helping families walk through the long-term care estimates and their risk assessment on what they need to do for long-term care. What do we do about retirement accounts? How do we come up with the other 50% that we need for those retirement accounts? What happens if your business partner walks in and says, hey, we want, I want out? Um, how do you come up with the equity to be able to buy him out. And we were in a very litigious um, society. So what happens if a lawsuit comes up and, and we 
had more global issues the past few years than we can ever thought we would, but how do those impact our farms? We do spend some time talking about retirement um, and to have your clients talk about the retirement. And we just pulled, I just pulled the 2024 income averages for the retired worker or for couples, 1900 or 3000, just over $3,000 for a couple. So when you think about this, and this comes back to that, that initial discussion that we had was how much do you live on? Which I think most families struggle to even know what they actually live on. But if a retired couple has a family living of $75,000, then in this case, based on the 2024 estimates for the annual income from Social Security, so this is for the average person, and farmers don't aren't average when it comes to paying taxes. They like to avoid self-employment tax. So some farm families may have less um, Social Security income that will come in as a couple or as an individual. But in this case, only about... 49% is actually covered through Social Security. Where So where's the rest of the income I'm going to come from? Are there retirement plans that have been in place? Is there a way that the business can fund some of those um, retirement programs? Or does this mean that the retirement income for the senior generation, and in some of our farms, it means two generations may be retired at the same time. Does some of that income have to come from the farm operation to be able to fund the retirement of the senior senior generation or generations. So having them uh, analyze exactly where does the retirement portfolio, what does it look like? And then to think about that, uh, for many married couples, they have never discussed what the perfect retirement life looks like. So we always give them some crayons and say, okay, draw your picture of what the perfect retirement looks like for you. Um, and then compare it with your spouse and with your kids. Um, to see how those match up, but have a thoughtful discussion about the retirement. Now, I will preface this saying that I know many farmers don't, they don't plan on retiring. In fact, as as humans, we were, we were made to work. We are made to work. We're designed to work. Um, so retirement may not mean full retirement out of a business, but for a family business, instead of it being called retirement, maybe they're pulling back and they become not the full-time manager, full-time employee of that farm, they're rolling back into a very minor part-time role um, that kind of fits their physical um, skills, depending on their age. And then as you build the plan, address the elephants in the room. Um, we've had many discussions here on IFTN talking about should heirs be treated equally in unequal situa situations. Um, here uh, in Ohio, it's not uncommon to have five, six, seven um, children that are the offsprings, the potential heirs for the business. And if one son or daughter has stayed on the farm, how do we how do we treat the on-farm heir versus those that are off the farm and to have a discussion through that process? How do you calculate the value of the son or daughter who stayed in the business? So the old sweat equity, and I believe it was probably maybe maybe a year ago or it was in the, within the last year or two years that we've had a whole session here on IFTN on value and sweat equity. Of course, Dave Gaylor out at University of Nebraska many years ago wrote a nice paper on this and has trained many of us to have this discussion. But having this discussion of how do you account for the sweat equity that may have been promised through the years, work for less now, we'll take care of you later, but how do we make sure that that sweat equity has been adequately covered in our transition and our estate plan? So um, having the having that conversation with the family, and then of course the then the next step is to develop that estate plan that aligns with the transition plan. Uh, asking your kids and grandkids what they think. Some families again they don't like to discuss, so we have a worksheet. What would you do with the family business? And I will tell you from a personal experience, my mom did this for our family. When my dad passed away, she emailed all of the three of us and said, hey, I'm trying to figure out what to do with the farm and how it's structured going forward in the future. What would you do if you were 100% in control? And she gave us like 30, 30 some days to get this back to her. And then she used that input that each of the three of us kids gave her 
And then she met with her attorneys, met with each of us to talk a little bit more about that. But then, of course, in the back of her mind was decades of conversations that my dad and her had through the years about what to do with the farm. So giving the kids and the grandkids some thoughts on it could be who do you think should manage the farm in the future? How do you think we should divide the farm? Uh, but it could be as simple as the question, who gets the butter churn, the family butter churn? I mean, in our family, that caused a lot of controversy. Who actually got the butter churn that was handed down from generation to generations? Uh, some of us work with uh, some of our family consumer science educators across the nation that do a uh, program called Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate? Uh, we try to bring some of that discussion in with those non-titled assets that are in the household and even a lot of the non-titled assets that may be out in the farm shop that we want to get to the next generation as well. And then we throw the carrot out there and say, how would you like to, to save like $3,500 of your the cost that you would have when you go to an attorney to, to put your plan together? And of course, then their ears will perk up. What? Save $3,500? So part of what we work through with farm families and what you can really add as a benefit to those farm families is getting your binder together or getting your affairs in order. And I know there's uh, different states that have different approaches to this. I believe there's like a code red um, out there that I think maybe the state of Indiana has and other states have these binders. We have a PDF writable document that we've been using for years where you can go through and list all your assets um, and and I'll show you the, the outline of what's in this 37 page document. But the key there is to put a notebook like you see there on the screen, putting having each family put a notebook together, walking through and then putting all the deeds. I believe if you look there on the left, you'll see the blue sheet is actually my birth certificate. And on the right is a title to one of our vehicles. And then behind it is a marriage certificate. I'm keeping death certificates and keeping all the titles to all of the title property that you have, especially you need to know how each parcel of land is titled. Your attorney's not gonna take your word for it. So having a copy of that title so that they have it so they can see how the beneficiaries are designated on it will save you a ton of time of having the attorney run into the courthouse and trying to track down all those documents. So all the financial accounts that you get, every year putting it into this notebook so that it's all together. So we, in this old PDF that we use, it has a lot of the background history stuff. So family stuff, whether it's from death certificates, birth certificates, the family health records, to all the estate documentation. So these on the front side of the estate planning process, like your power of attorneys, your living wills, all those things are in the front side with the estate documentation. And then there's a whole financial section to list all your retirement checking and savings accounts. And then the assets. So the assets will be personal assets. So that could be jewelry, antiques, uh, the non-titled assets. And I see I haven't misspelled. It shouldn't say non-titled, but non-titled assets. Then the farm assets. Uh, what is the farm assets that we have? Then also it's nice because um, in a period of transition, where are the land rental agreements? Where are the maps? Like for instance, on our farm, where are the maps for the tile lines? If there's oil and gas lease documentation, solar leases, any other type of energy leases that might be there, as well as all our business agreements, whether it's LLCs or our trust or a corporation, are all they all together in one place? And then we have a tab completely on the funeral planning side. So that could be everything for the funeral, uh, down to people that you need to call that I might not know to call to let them know that you have passed away. So this is kind of some of the grim stuff. We, we really love this PDF and love how it works. Uh, and you can type into it. The only thing I, I like to see values added up and, and stuff pulled together. So uh, just back in the at May, we had a farm management retreat here with our farm management specialist and Robert Moore, who is our one of our agriculture attorneys in our OSU um, Ag and Resource Law Program. And I were talking about our farm succession workshops. 
And we were talking about how do we take this PDF and then transition it into a spreadsheet. Now, our whole goal with this spreadsheet is to make sure that everything gets into the spreadsheet. But for the estate planning process of this is to have a summary sheet so we know as we're having this fair versus equal and who gets what kind of discussions that is automatically behind the scenes pulling all these different financial amounts, whether it's an IRA or land, and it's pulling it. And then we can see what is the balance between our heirs that we're leaving. So we've developed a spreadsheet called the Farm Asset and Resource Management Spreadsheet, affectionately known as FARMS. And this is how we are now working. It's in the beta version where we hope to have the complete version done um, this winter. But I kind of want to tell you what's in it when you open it up. Anything that you see in red, you would click on it and you would go to that page. And this is our goal is to work with agriculture attorneys, extension educators, and farm management consultants in our state to be able to use this as as a spreadsheet that they can help their farm families pull the stuff together that they need. Um, so an attorney can say, you know what, you can meet with your extension educator, pull the, all this stuff together and then come back to us. And then we can kind of put your plan in motion. So I'm just gonna quickly go through these, um, just a few of the slides, like there's some basic estate planning questions where you can populate and put your children's name and then your grandchildren and other family members adding those in so you can list because the attorney is going to ask, well, who are who are potential heirs? And then everything is clicked so you can go back to the main page. When you go back, there's an estate planning questions. So we're asking, do you have the trust, will, financial power attorney? Again, these are all questions that an attorney would ask. So it's starting then getting the process. So yes, I have a trust. And then the additional question, like, and it doesn't show up on the screen, but if you mark yes for do you have a trust, the next additional question will be is where's the location of this trust and where's the documentation? So there's a place to put their goal for the estate and then a place to, to list their gifts that they've already given. And it will go through. The nice thing about this is you never know how many heirs or how many accounts that could might be in a certain section. So we've tried to make uh, a base spreadsheet, but if you have more to add, like additional beneficiaries, you can just click a quick button and then it will uh, add an, uh, another line so you can put the person's name in there. So then you get into the farm financial accounts. You can start to see, we start to go through the farms. Um, so this is bank accounts, which both are personal and farm. You can see there's a couple banks that are listed there with the balance, with the account number and the owner. Again, knowing who is the owner of each account, but notice what it's done behind the scenes. Um, in the old document, you'd have to put out a, just a handwritten note, who's the beneficiary. But if they filled out the first sheet correctly on the spreadsheet, when you go back and add, say, my Huntington bank account that has $37,000 in it, the owner's Brutus Buckeye, when I click under the beneficiary category, it is now going to populate a list with everyone who I said might be a potential heir or beneficiary. So the goal is they collect, um, select and say, I'm going to leave it to, say, Jesse Owens. And then that is going to start tracking each person, each beneficiary, what is given to to um, to each person. And there is an ability here to say, oh, no, I'm going to have three beneficiaries from this account, and that's able to go there as well. And then we go through the whole life insurance and other um, inheritance that might come through or money that's owed to me. And then there's beneficiaries as well as contingent, contingent ben beneficiaries. There's a whole page on the farm business entity, so where you can put the different uh, entities like this is a Buckeye LLC entity, which is a partnership, who owns what and what is the valuation for that. And then the same thing with real estate is the general description, the acreage, the value, what is the current value, and then you can select beneficiaries through that. Same with farm assets, putting everything that you have on the farm. Uh, so there's uh, no a lot of farms, we find out that there may be two or three tractors and there's confused after dad dies that did dad own that or is that something the son or daughter bought? 
thought along the way. And sometimes that can lead to some disagreement. So here you can put everything in. Same with your non-business assets. And then putting your liabilities in, the different liabilities that you might own, whether it's current, um, intermediate, and real estate mortgages. And then what we feel will be the beauty of this when it comes to the estate planning process is you can see when you go to the balance sheet page. So this is basically the summary of the estate. It's going to pull together a balance sheet for Brutus and Candy Buckeye for owner one. So husband and wife, it's going to show what portion of that estate is attributed to each person. So you have Brutus and Candy as a husband and wife, but then because they own some of their accounts maybe a little bit differently, you can see that is separate. Now our goal is, and we're not quite there yet, you see where it says air one, air two, air three, air four. The goal is, is those, those are replaced and each of, say, let's say you have four children. So you have mom and dad on here and then you have the four children, boom, boom, boom. Their name comes up and it starts to populate the value of the estate that at the current time that you are leaving to them. And this allows you to see that difference between equal versus fair and to see actually how do I have my estate? Um, because I might be leaving a sizable life insurance to one son or daughter where the other son or daughter may be getting most of the acreage, or I might be leaving two farms over here, one farm over there, and it allows you to put it all on one sheet and then see where that estate stands. And then, of course, there's other things behind the scenes, the retirement planning, the power of attorneys, of who is going to be the different power attorneys or the living will, um, guardian over minor children. We even have who's going to be the minor, uh, the guardian over domestic pets, because the most the, the thing that's going to miss you the most in most farms is the farm dog is going to miss their master the most. So who gets to take care of that farm dog? Family and farm advisors being able to put that in there. So there's contact information to help for that continuity. Location of all the valuable papers that you have. Where are they? Where's the insurance policies? So these this is more of those casualty policy, um, the farm insurance um, for the real estate, for the vehicles, those type of things on the insurance page, passwords, funeral planning. So you can plan your entire um, funeral together. And then pallbearers, clear up to friends and relatives who should be notified upon your death. And then if you have some special statement of intents that you want your attorney to know or your your heirs to know, it allows you to list that as well. So we are in the process of kind of fine tuning this, massaging the edges, using um, some people who are a lot smarter than we, Robert and I are, uh, to help us with some of the back scenes on the macros. If you're interested in that, maybe you want to, when we get it to a version where if maybe you want to beta test it for us or take a look at it, uh, there'll be a time here as we move into the new year that we're going to ask people to take a look at this and to help us with this. And then we'll we'll put it out live. But if you're interested in getting um, on that list to see the spreadsheet in the future, I have made a quick go link there for you. Go.osu.edu forward slash Excel with farms. Or you can snap a picture there right now and just put your information in there. And then I'll make sure you're on our list to get this once we've got it all uh, massaged out. So that takes you to the destiny phase. And that's just getting the timeline uh, for the transition and the implementation. And then I'll starting to put that plan into place. How are you methodically going to go transfer the ownership, the management, the knowledge, and then how are you going to put in place the business meetings to be able to track progress? And then how are you going to keep the communication open between generations so that you're looking at this plan as you're starting to um, go through it, then having the ability to be able to tweak and make adjustments along the way at the same time. And then Heather, I see one chat. And she's got the link for the CEUs in the chat. And we try to ha have farmers think about where are they on the tape measure of life. It's a quick, easy visual because everyone has a tape measure to pull out a tape measure, run it across the, the desk and see, OK, if you're the age of 55, how many more inches of life that you have? And it's pretty 
easy perspective to look at the 55 inches that's already passed versus May the, the 13 to 15 years that may may come to have that visualization about the tape measure for them. And there's my contact information. If you have any desire for the um, presentation slides, or if you say, no, David, I really just want to look at your worksheets. If you want to see what those worksheets are that we use, um, anything with our farm management team at Ohio State, the only thing you have to remember is farmoffice.osu.edu, which is not on this screen, farmoffice.osu.edu. We do have a tab there under our library for our estate and succession planning materials, as well as we have a tab there. Uh, you can see how we do our workshops across the state. And soon to be, there will be a link there about the, the Excel document that we're putting together too. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop me a line there through email or give me a buzz someday. Okay, Heather, that's all I have. We got two minutes, so <laughs> you did great. Clock. You're done. <laughs> two minutes to my clock. So, okay. Any questions or anything for David at this time? No questions. Just really appreciate some of your worksheets and look forward to checking them out more closely. Thank you for doing this. And I guess my one thing of advice here: so easy to do what we call splash and dash programs, right? We blow in, we blow off, and we blow out, right? Um, you know, as professionals, to do those hour or two long or two hour things, to do this right, we really, really, really need to have people sit through and do some of these workshop uh, worksheets to get them to think about it. So you mentioned about the farm office link that was referenced. Yeah, that's farm office .osu. Edu. So that's kind of our clearinghouse for farm management stuff for our team here in Ohio. Farm office. Edu. There you go. Thank you, Heather. And the info on the February sessions is also under the farm office. Edu website. You'll see um, farm succession or transition planning right on the top link. You click on it and you can you can see it. If you want to take me up, you heard me say, yeah, you can do. So here's what we charge. We charge $75 per family. We don't care how many people um, get the connection link from the family. We've had people from 10 different states attend with their parents, which has been really cool. What we do is we mail one worksheet, one workbook out to the, to the primary registrant. And then they have access to all the online handouts for anybody else from the family who jumps in from the family. They can download it to their computer and use it however they want. But for one price, $75, they get on um, for their entire family. So we've had like, I think the most 10 people from one family joined us once. Um, but if you want to get on for free, like for because you're um, friends of IFTN, then all you need to do is email me and I will I will comp you the link to get into it. I'll just put you on the registration and you'll get all the registration details for, um, for free.